So hi everyone and welcome to yet another episode of the Foss North pod. Uh, today we have uh, Javier from uh, from CERN joining us and, and uh, talking a bit about open hardware and open silicon and so on. So Javier, do you want to say a few words about yourself? Yes, uh, so thank you for uh, the, the invitation. Uh, my name is Javier Serrano. I'm Spanish. I um, started working at CERN in 1998. And uh, currently, I'm leading a, a section of uh, hardware developers and uh, low-level software developers as well. Uh, and we do accelerator controls, so controls, uh, control systems for particle accelerators. Wow. <laughs> so should we start off with, like, see, with open hardware is a new thing. I guess for most people, it, it still is for me, although I've, I've known it for, for a couple of years. So can you please like say what open hardware is? Yes, I guess the, the easiest uh, is to go to the definition, uh, which is currently, I, I think the most widely accepted definition for open hardware is the one maintained by the Open Source Hardware Association. And um, it's a longish definition inspired by the open source definition, actually. But the first uh, sentence, um, I, I think, quite sums it up, which is open source hardware is hardware whose design is made publicly available so that anyone can study, modify, distribute, make, and sell the design or hardware based on that design. So the, this last bit is what sets it apart as well for, from, uh, from, uh, from the open source, standard open source software. And I, th I think it also pinpoints where the main difference is since, uh, since software is intangible, while you with open hardware actually end up with physical goods, it's, uh, there is yes. differences in, in how, how the whole market works, basically, since you actually have to implement something to, to have it. Distributed. Definitely. There are tricky bits about it and there are good things about it, but definitely that's that's the key difference. And that's where uh, sometimes we would like to capitalize as much as possible on um, free and open source software, uh, because it, it is something that's proven to work and it has, has many successes. Uh, and um, whenever we come across issues where we cannot apply directly the teachings of, of free and open source software, it is because of that, exactly what you said, which is uh, market, um, uh, economic considerations, all related to the fact that hardware is, is tangible, yes, as opposed to software. Okay, so when and perhaps even how did, uh, did the open hardware thing start? I, I think the um, there is... Um, um, a gathering of momentum towards the last few years of the first decade of this century, so 2008, 2009, where many people start, I think, realizing that uh, it was becoming easier and easier to develop hardware. And uh, I, I think that's also kind of what happened. That, that's my interpretation of what happened with software as well. Software becomes more widely spread and more um, accessible to people in terms of development in the 90s. And, and then it becomes really a big concern to um, guarantee that it can be shared efficiently and without any legal hurdles. Uh, and then there's all this movement put in place to, to, for example, make sure that people have the tools to do it appropriately, et cetera. Uh, because the loss for society, if they, they didn't put this thing in place, would be uh, quite big because there were so many people e capable all of a sudden of developing software. And, and something um, something uh, similar happened in hardware, uh, but later. Okay, so it became with, with the arrival of, of Arduino and with the arrival of good open source tools to design printed circuit boards, uh, and later on even more with the 3D printers and, and uh, all the mechanical CAD software, all these enabled people to do things, uh, even, even for hobbyists, they would, they would, you know, hobbyists are now capable of designing things uh, that would have taken a small company a few years ago to do. So uh, with, with that democratization of access to, um, to hardware design um, came the, uh, the realization that we needed to put in place uh, 
infrastructure to share appropriately and and um, of course following on the footsteps of uh, of the software world which was you know uh, uh, had solved most of the important issues already so when it comes to to open hardware i mean we we have a a spectrum of of, of devices all the way from from like laying out pcbs and, and putting physical components in there where i guess we have quite a lot of open source tooling and then then we have this gray zone passing through cplds and and asics through fpgas until we're really really soft at the end um but when it comes to to software or the corresponding technology to compiler so basically software for implementing these would you say that the the full spectrum is covered or are there weak spots and blank spots no for example we are we're having a discussion right now in our group at cern because we want to start doing uh, what the software people have been doing for many years which is continuous integration for hdl design and and it would be so nice if every time we uh, modified something it went through a whole set of tests uh, and in our case um uh instead of a as a, instead of a compiler, we need to use something called a, a synthesizer, a synthesis tool uh, to generate the hardware, and also a, a, a simulator. A simulator is a piece of software that will take your HDL code and then some other HDL code, which is not your design, but something that's like stimuli, and uh, it will apply them and it will see what comes out and it will uh, hopefully say that everything's all right. Um, and um, and for HDL, we use a number of languages. We use VHDL, Verilog, System Verilog, and mix, mixed language simulators. So simulators which can take a uh, design made of many blocks in different languages. Um, there's no good open source um, uh, product to do that. There's, there's, no, there's no project that does that. There's a very good VHDL simulator. There, there are good Verilog simulators. But there's no simulator that will take sources from many different languages and, and run them together. So uh, that's a big problem for us because um, we want to do continuous integration. But that means that every time we run our tests, we're going to be taking one of the expensive licenses from uh, the pool of licenses at CERN. So if everybody does these and we don't coordinate uh, the, the times that we do this, we might actually run out of licenses. So it is it is a big concern. And uh, I think it's probably among the set of issues that needed um, a solution back when we started in the uh, more than 10 years ago. Uh, that's probably the one that remains uh, the biggest hurdle to sharing today. It's the lack of appropriate tools, uh, software tools, which are free and open source for the type of things we do in hardware. You mentioned earlier that, I can't remember exactly, but that the uh, open hardware definition was sort of inspired by the open source definition or free software definition. Yes. Uh, so uh, how similar do you think the movements are? Very, very similar. Uh, the end goal is the same. The end goal is to... Uh, guarantee a number of freedoms or, or, or uh, make sure that sharing can be done efficiently, depending on how you look at it. I don't look at these things as contradicting each other, but complementing each other. So uh, it is exactly the same ethos and uh, the, the same key idea behind, except it is applied to hardware designs instead of, of software. So uh, when, when you try to uh, transpose that world of free software to, to the hardware realm, you come across a number of issues. And in fact, that was my journey, actually. That's that's the way I, I started uh, doing this. I, in our team, we have two sub-teams. One is a team of hardware developers, and the other one is a team of Linux kernel hackers. And and uh, the whole idea was you know, looking at, at how the Linux people uh, worked, the, their daily experience, you know, could we get that for the hardware people? That's, uh, you know, the, how easy it was for them to interact with the outside world, to tap into the big knowledge base uh, outside, to collaborate with other labs and companies without uh, falling into a vendor lock-in situation. All these good things, uh, we wanted to have them for hardware as well. So uh, to answer your question, I think the, the end goal is exactly the same, or at least that's, that, that's how I came to this. I mean, that, that's, that's my angle. 
Cool. Uh, and the communities, so <laughs> do you have like the rivalry between open source and free software? Also? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I think uh, there were some talks many years back because there, there were a number of initiatives uh, uh, at roughly the same time. And um, luckily that didn't go further than just some people drawing parallelisms between uh, those different communities and the free software versus open source uh, 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 controversy in software, uh, that didn't go very far. I think everybody agrees these days that um, you know the the open source definition is 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 a reference for people doing open source hardware. Uh, I, I don't think there is this um, rivalry or this controversy. Uh, so I, I think we're very lucky that it didn't take. It didn't. Yeah. Uh, good for you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Would, would, you, would you say that you relate to to other movements that have come more recently? Like uh, you, you have this right to repair movement, and so oh, on. of course, of course, yes, um, definitely. Is, is this the same people, or is this a parallel group that then share the same goals, basically? Yeah, um, I, I think everybody is. Uh, scratching their own itch and then somebody some people come to open hardware from that angle of right to repair uh, and some people come through other from other uh, you know uh, experiences uh, but it definitely there's a relationship between uh, because in the sense that if you want to have the right to repair then having you know repairing something which is open source is much easier do, do you see an adoption of open licenses when it comes to uh, to reference designs when it comes to hardware? I mean, it, it, I'm uh, I'm a layman in this. I'm more of a software guy, but so so if mm -hmm. I design hardware, I usually copy basically the the, the application notes. Uh, yes, and I would assume that they would benefit from coming under something like permissive open license. That that would be the software way to do it to provide an example. Yes. Uh, yes, um, it, it, it must be said that um, um, the legal status of those diagrams um, is something that historically was not fully clear, I think. I think people assumed, and rightfully so, because, you know, when, when, when a big uh, silicon vendor provides example schematics, their goal is for you to use them, of course. Uh, so I, I don't think people ask themselves the question of whether they can use them or not, because obviously the intent of the vendor is that you can use them. Okay, so it would be ridiculous that the vendor sues you for copyright infringement because you used their example. Uh, but but when... Um, so so, uh, but now, and also the, um, the, the fact that good, good licenses didn't exist you know, uh, so there was no point in asking the question, should this be licensed under this or that license to make it rock solid from a legal point of view? Uh, now that Git licenses exist for uh, that kind of work, for schematics, for example, and layout, uh, I, I think it would be a good idea to explicitly say what it is that you're expecting people to do or to be able to do with your schematics. Yeah. I guess you so, can come to, to some interesting scenarios, even with examples. So perhaps uh, building an example out of other people's examples and mixing components from vendors who, who are competing and things like this, where, mm -hmm. you're sort of, where it would be nice to have clarity. Exactly. Yeah. And that's that's the... That's uh, overflowing for, for hardware, you mean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How do I drive an engine? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's exactly the goal of the licensing effort that we have been carrying out in uh, at CERN is to bring clarity. Exactly, uh, you know, because uh, it could look like a complicated document the first time you read it, but but things are complicated sometimes, and, and sometimes you need uh, a license which is not trivial to express what you want. But once you have studied it, 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 it and it has been scrutinized by many people and accepted, then it becomes um, a zero effort way of, of making sure that your design is shared as you intended. And, and it is, yeah, one of the main uh, objectives we had when we drafted, uh, especially the latest version, version two of the CERN Open Hardware License, uh, was clarity, you know, how to make sure that people understand exactly what we intend. 
it's a it's a bit similar to how people um, reason about the the GPL. It's very long and complicated, but it's long and complicated for a reason. Mm -hmm. Exactly, and of course, GPL was a big source of inspiration for us uh, in the beginning. The CERN Open Hardware License was a uh, I would say a strongly reciprocal license um, because at the time also um, the default license for software at CERN was, was GPL and uh, it still is. Um, and, um, and then with time we realized that different projects had different needs and, and one of the big things we've done in version two of the license is to split in three variants so that people can have a, a permissive license if they want, or a weekly reciprocal one, or a, or a strongly reciprocal one. Do you address things like um, patents and, and such in the license as well? I mean, that's something that came with GPL v3, but I, I assume, and software patents is still not widely accepted. Yes. Uh, but I, I guess for hardware, it, it's... Of course, problem. it's not an option. In in hardware, talking about patents is not an option. Uh, it's the elephant in the room. So, <laughs> uh, so uh, of course, um, uh, we have, in the beginning, we had this patent license um, that, that we had from very early on, in which you, you say, okay, I'm publishing these schematics, and I give you the right to copy them, to use them, or whatever. Uh, and then, also, I give you the right uh, to use any of the patents that I hold that you would need to make use of these schematics, okay? Because of course it would be ridiculous that I give you something and then I sue you for using it. Uh, you know, so so I'm reassuring you that I will not sue you for patent infringement in this particular design, okay? Uh, then um, something that I you know immediately after we published uh, version 1.2, I. I I, I, I thought that I wanted to have this from another license, which is like the precursor, which is the Tupper license, um, uh, which, which had a, a, a complementary clause in which the, uh, if, if somebody, so, so I, I'm a licensor and, and I'm publishing this design and you use it, uh, but then if you sue me for patent infringement, you lose also your rights uh, for this design. So it's kind of the complementary clause um, and, and that we added in version two. So it's, it's two ways. Uh, and the aim, of course, is uh, as, as, as the creator of the Tupper license wanted in the beginning when, when he came up with the, the original Tupper license, is to, to have this ever-expanding area of patent-free designs uh, of, of, of um, a guarantee that you will not be sued for patent infringement if you're in that kind of ecosystem. Do you have these organizations like the Open Invention Network uh, that exists around Linux, for instance, where you basically create a, a patent pool uh, mm -hmm. between members? Uh, I I don't uh, I don't know the details. For example, of the um, uh, that there are a number of organizations about Risk Five, for example, and I, I don't know if they do that kind of thing of pooling patents. I I don't know. Uh, they they may do so because there are some big players in there, and that's typically what they do. But um, I I don't have details. Yeah. Can I just ask you? You mentioned that there are three variants of the of the open hardware license. Mm -hmm. That there's a a permissive one, a strong reciprocal one, and a weak reciprocal one. Yes. How how does I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm trying to think what the what would constitute linking <laughs> yes. in, in, in a weak reciprocal license. Could you elaborate yes. on that? Yes, of course. And then this is, of course, where we had to work hard um, uh, to, uh, to come up with new concepts. Uh, the, in the two reciprocal variants, the strong one and the weak one, we needed to uh, make it clear where the obligations stop. Uh, for for feeding back improvements, for example. So with our colleague, uh, Andrew Katz, who's a, a lawyer specialized in, in open source and open hardware in particular, uh, he came up with um, this notion of uh, available component and the notion of product. So when you have a design going down, when you start zooming in, okay, uh, your obligations stop at available component. And an available component could be something like a resistor. If you, if you, um, 
if you design something and put a resistor there, uh, we're not requiring that you publish the recipe to make a resistor out of carbon and metal and, and things like that. Okay, so it is not, but it is important. <laughs> it is important because you know uh, uh, a naive reading of some of the reciprocal software licenses uh, would make it would leave you with a doubt of whether you need to do that, okay? You would so, have basically have to be like a, a physicist to build all Yes, <laughs> yes, so it was very, very forge, important. Forge the metal as well. Exactly, yeah. it, it was very important to, uh, to, uh, to, um, to, to establish limits going down and then going up as well. We have the notion of product, which is what you make out of the sources and that's a product, okay? So if I design a mouse, a computer mouse, and then um, I make the product, which is the mouse, which is clearly defined because that's what I make out of the design, okay? Uh, then if I connect it to a PC, uh, that PC is beyond the product, okay? So I don't need to publish the schematics of the PC just because I connected uh, the mouse to the PC, okay? So uh, from that point of view, with, with those notions, those two notions, available component and product, I, I think we pretty much manage to... Uh, to uh, to make it clear what should be shared and not shared in every given in each given uh, uh, variant of the license. Then, okay, th there are there are also um, complications, especially when you get to the HDL realm. HDL is very tricky for reasons which were mentioned earlier. Um, it behaves as software sometimes, and it behaves as, as hardware sometimes. Uh, you can, for the same sources, they can take different paths. And if you simulate them, you're actually running software in your computer. You're running them as software. But if you make a, a chip out of it, this is something that, you know, the, the, the reference definition we have for hardware is something that you can drop on your foot. So it is, a chip is hardware. And, and, uh, and then it, beca it, it becomes a legal, from a legal perspective, something different. Um, so um, for these, uh, and then to complicate things even more, the uh, the tools in in ASIC design are historically quite proprietary, and also to complicate things even further, part of those tools are primitives and and bits of uh, software and gateware which end up being part of your design as well, and they are also very proprietarily licensed historically, so. Um, uh, excluding those bits uh, from the uh, from the reciprocal obligations is key if you want to make these licenses usable. Even even uh, even the strongly reciprocal one, you know, you, you need to exclude those bits because otherwise it's completely unrealistic to expect, uh, at least today, that people design chips in which even the primitives, even the silicon primitives, are open source, uh, and that will probably change in the future. But and, and the, there are some efforts underway for that. But uh, today, you know, if we want people to be able to use a strongly reciprocal variant of the license for chip design, uh, there's some things that we need to cater for. And, uh, and, and there was an effort in version two of the license for that, yes. Maybe we should do a quick, just recap around that. Uh, so, so an HDL, a hardware definition language, um, is used to define the behavior of hardware. And then, as as you say there, Javier, you can you can run it in a simulator, which means that it's interpreted as software, basically. And I I think I recall that that was how it all started, with the uh, the DARP organization wanted to be able to specify silicon yes. through, uh, through an HDL and not necessarily implement it or synthesize it from it. Uh, but then the other problem is, uh, and it's decades since I did this, is that you have a software kind of hardware, like an FPGA, which is programmed by a bit file. Uh, and yes. I'm not sure if you can break out a part of a bit file and, and sort of replace it on the fly. I think you need to synthesize the whole thing mm -hmm. each time, which means that dynamic linking is basically impossible and it's hard to sort of create object files and provide them to, to fulfill these uh, uh, LGPL yes. uh, license-like things, but you could also take this HDL and then bring it into um, into an ASICs, so actually creating your own dedicated silicon. There is nothing soft left about it. And, and as you say there, you get a gate library from the ASIC vendor, basically telling you how their gates and, and gate combinations look. And that's sort of the, the building blocks that your synthesizing tool 
implement your HTL description using. Uh, so, you, so you can apply this from everywhere to a piece of sand to pure software, and it's the same source code. Uh, mm -hmm. Just a quick recap for all our, our software devs out there. Yes, uh, definitely. Uh, that's that's a, a, a good summary. Uh, we we write HDL and then we run it through a tool called Synthesis Tool, which is the equivalent or the analogous of, of a compiler. And uh, this tool uses primitives which are available um, in the, for example, in an FPGA, which is something that many people use these days. Field programmable gate array has primitives, and the uh, Synthesis Tool is going to uh, interpret what you wanted in your H, uh, the, the behavior you wanted uh, as you expressed it in your HCL. And it will uh, then use the primitives to, um, to, con to, to, uh, to uh, create a circuit that behaves, that, that fulfills the behavior that you specified in your HCL. Yes, that's, uh, that's correct. And in the case of the FPGAs, uh, that ends up being a bit stream that you load on the chip. Um, from Flash or, or remotely. And, um, and in the case of ASICs, it becomes a piece of silicon. So this really, the, the, the fact that uh, we can take these two routes uh, and the fact that the tools are um, historically very, very proprietary and we cannot benefit as the free software world from free compilers and free editors, et cetera, uh, at least not to such a, a large extent, that really complicates the licensing. So uh, yes, that was a challenge. W would you say that it makes sense to create open tools here? Be because to some extent, I guess the primitives and the, the actual optimizations or heuristics of the algorithms are specific to the, the physical properties of, for instance, an FPGA. That somewhere there's a boundary where you go from generic software to, to something that's very specific to hardware design. Yeah, but I, I don't see that much of a difference with the world of, of software in the sense that an ARM processor and an Intel processor and a RISC-V processor also have different um, internal architectures and different instruction sets. Uh, and um, and the, the silicon vendors have disclosed enough information for people to write compilers. Uh, so uh, could we have something uh, similar from the from the FPGA world? That would be really nice. So if they disclosed enough information for people uh, to uh, to write synthesis tools and uh, place and root tools. Uh, it, it would be great. There are some heroic efforts of reverse engineering these days, and some are quite spectacular. Uh, but it would be really nice if they could just get the information they need from the vendor. And, and I think um, I have the, uh, the, the, the suspicion that if, if one vendor did that, they, 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 it could also be a competitive advantage for them. It would be the vendor that gives you all these details. So uh, maybe they could get more business out of it. I don't know. I'm not well positioned to say what they would lose. But I, I, so, so what are the uh, reasons why they don't do it today? I, I don't know, but I, I can imagine that uh, there would be uh, a lot of people using what you know a, a new FPGA family uh, if it had reasonable performance, and in addition to that, it, it was uh, open from an architecture point of view, so that the tools could be open source. Yeah, and I imagine that a lot of the the investment that they make these days is in the tooling. So if you can share mm -hmm. that maintenance and that development, yes, that would probably help. Yes, exactly. The same way that, again, uh, in analogy with the processors, uh, the same way why that that the big processor vendors, um, you know, allow people to to make compilers for those processors and benefit from those, you know, many many brains thinking about how to optimize code and so on, and they end up making money out of the silicon and not of the software. Um, I I could see that that should be able to work as well in the FPGA world. Yeah. I'm a bit curious. We mentioned a couple of minutes ago, or like a minute ago, uh, the software again, and I'm. I'm thinking if if I'm listening to this and actually I'm like asking for myself. So how do I begin? Is it possible for me to begin today uh, with open hardware? And like, what do I get? How how do I do things? 
Mm-hmm. Is there a startup guy? Yes, <laughs> uh, it depends. Uh, uh, it, there is, you know, um, it's a bit like in 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 software in the sense that um, you you need to have like a domain, something that you want to do, right? It, 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 there's no startup guide to starting in, in free and open source software. But if you like, for example, to design uh, music software, then uh, you join an, people who have a similar interest, and then you will have all the tools you need to write the software. You will choose a language, you will get a, a number of tools to help you, editors, uh, compilers, debuggers, and so on, and then you will you will start collaborating with your colleagues. Uh, the same thing for hardware. I mean, you, you can uh, have an interest in developing Printed circuit boards, or designing uh, 3D printable objects, or or uh, going into gateway, you know, and buying a development kit for one of the FPGA from one of the FPGA vendors, and starting to write uh, HDL and and synthesizing and uh, and uh, generating a bitstream that you can use. So uh, yes, uh, the answer is you can start, but that, there's no general recipe that I know of. It de- really depends on what you want to do. Uh, so I figured it, it's kind of easier. You just uh, apt get install GCC <laughs> and, and you can start developing, or yes. another language if you're if you yeah. that. Yeah. So it depends again. Again, if you want to do a printed circuit board, for example, at CERN we are big fans of KiCad, which is this PCB design tool that uh, we are contributing to. And, and we are trying to get the drawing office, that means the people doing layout for certain designers eight hours a day uh, to uh, provide KiCad support in addition to the proprietary tools that they are already using. So if your goal is to do a little PCB, uh, uh, for example, uh, um, an add-on board for your Arduino or something like that, then it's it's very, very simple to get it done with KiCad. And then there are other free tools as well. And apt-get will also get you KiCad, yes. Ah, okay. <laughs> yeah. Cool. So at CERN, you, and I think you run it, am I right? The open uh, hardware repository. Yes, uh, oh. yes. Can you describe it? It's uh, well today. It's nothing special. It used to be something that we judged necessary when we started, which is a place on the web to share hardware designs. Okay. Uh, now, of course, nowadays it's easy. If you want to share something, you upload it to one of these very famous uh, Git-based uh, places, and uh, and um, you're you're good to go. There's there's nothing keeping mm-hmm. you from sharing. Uh, uh, when we started the open hardware repository, I think it was 2007, 2008. Um, there was it was not so simple. Plus, also we wanted to have a place where we could grow a community around, like the people with an interest in 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 our case, it's um, controls and data acquisition systems for big physics facilities. Okay, telescopes, uh, cosmic ray detectors, neutrino detectors, uh, particle accelerators. So these are the people we meet at conferences, and they have similar interests to ours. So. Um, these are the people we could potentially share our designs with. Because of course, uh, there's no point in putting a design out there if nobody can use it or nobody has an interest in using it. So the other part of the equation for us is, is this community with uh, people with similar interests. So the, the, uh, today, the Open Hardware Repository is nothing else than a, a GitLab instance, GitLab, GitLab Community Edition. And, uh, and and uh, it's it's a convenient place to to share designs. It has version management. It has a wiki. It has um, uh, we we attach a discourse instance so that people can discuss in forums. So every project has an attached uh, discourse forum. Uh, so it's nothing special by today's standards. Uh, what makes it special for us is that uh, we know many people working there, and uh, we share many interesting designs with them. Okay, uh, so for me, I'm I'm a huge fan of what CERN does. I'm super interested in physics and uh, basically whatever you do down there. So I'm interested in what is a normal, or A, is there a normal day? And if there is a normal day, how does that look like for you? Uh-huh. Uh, I, I, I don't think there's a... 
a normal day they 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 could be a normal week uh, okay in the sense that uh, you know <laughs> uh, we do a number of things i i for example i do a, a number of things and and some days i do more management some days i do more more um, technical stuff so uh the perfect week for me is made of a bit of everything a bit of uh of course technical work is is the the uh, the main activity so uh, in our case uh designing electronics to control particle accelerators. And in particular, we have a big interest in synchronization systems. So how to make sure that if you have two pieces of electronics, which are distant with respect to one another by several kilometers, that they share a common notion of time, okay? That they know at the same instant, they think the time is the same to within typically one nanosecond. So one, one billionth of a second. Uh, so that's our big specialty. Uh, so uh, on a typical week, um, I would discuss with my colleagues. Uh, nowadays, I do less and less design, but I still try to, you know, keep contact with the, either through design reviews or informal discussions to try to understand what's going on and to try to drive it in some kind of way. Uh, there would also be management these days. Uh, so in my particular case, my main goal is to make sure my colleagues are not overloaded, which is our uh, biggest problem. So too many interesting projects. And in the end, we can have a, a problem if, if we take on too many things at the same time. So uh, I have a, a keen interest these days in, in reducing the workload. And that's, uh, I think, the main service I, I'm giving to my colleagues is trying to take care of them, uh, make sure they have labs and all the gear they need and, and so on, but also enough time to do things right. Uh, and then uh, there, there would be, in a perfect week, there would be also a bit of outreach, uh, like what I'm doing now with you guys or discussing with uh, people outside, which is also part of the mission at CERN. To, to, uh, to talk with people, explain what we do. Uh, to um, there's also education. So uh, I'm, I'm an official CERN guide. That means that you know there are groups of students coming. Uh, not now uh, with COVID. Uh -oh. <laughs> Yes, and, and I, I tour CERN with them, and I, uh, I enjoy very much, for example, teaching them physics through uh, hands-on experiments, uh, doing a cloud chamber to detect cosmic rays uh, and things like that. So there would be uh, a, a, a bit of that, but yes, the, uh, the, main, the main activity is technical. In our typical week is a, a lot of electronics and software. Cool. Uh, where do I sign up for the <laughs> go to jobs.web.cern.ch? Oh. Everything's explained there. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. The, the, you, for, for quite a few years, you, you've been publishing so much, not only hardware, but also software. So it seems as if you've been doing public money, public code before the concept uh, like arrived. Yes. yes. And this is where the, the founding fathers. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot say fathers and mothers. Uh, it was only fathers at the time. Uh, but uh, the founding fathers of CERN, uh, um, they were extremely visionary, actually. Uh, they signed something called the CERN Convention uh, in the 50s, in, in 1953. And if you read this document today, it is... Um, um, very refreshing read, actually, extremely modern. Uh, and uh, I, I would say more modern that, than the founding documents on many, many more recent uh, institutions. So um, one of the things it says is that um, uh, in, in Article 2, the purposes, is that the organization shall have no concern with work for military requirements, which was a big thing, of course, after the World War. <laughs> if you put the, the words nuclear and military in the same sentence, it was a big no-no, of course. But then he continues to say that the results of his, its experimental and theoretical work shall be, made, shall be pub published or otherwise made generally available. And then later on, uh, it says that this can include cooperation with outside laboratories, and, and this cooperation may include, in particular, the dissemination of information. Now, uh, if you read this in the uh, technological scene of the 21st century, many of us uh, interpret that this means uh, open source, that, that open source is a very, very efficient way 
of uh, fulfilling this part of our mission. So uh, there are different people at CERN with different interests. You have software developers, and for them, free and open source software is one way of doing this. There are people dealing with data, and, and they use open data. There are people doing uh, publications, scientific publications, and, and CERN plays a big role in open access as well. Uh, and for us, hardware designers, open hardware is a very, very natural way to fulfill that mandate. Has any useful software come out of uh, CERN? I'm uh, kidding. Uh, uh, aside I'm from kidding. HTTP, you mean? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. Um, but it's actually kind of fun because we've had, well, three speakers, if counting this one, in, in FOSNOR scenarios. So, so, so one of the very first speakers we had, which unfortunately is not recorded, was Alessandro Rubini, uh -huh. who worked exactly on this keeping time in Linux systems. Yes, of course. I worked uh, a lot with Alessandro, and I, I have the fondest memories of those times, and I, I have a lot of respect for him, technically yeah, that, and, and not technically. <laughs> yes. no, that, that was a very appreciated talk, actually. Good mm -hmm. fun. He showed us how to keep your own lab equipment. Mm -hmm. you, you put a big sticker on it that says broken, then you get a very Very original thinker as well. Yes, Alessandro. <laughs> Yes. A question about Alexander. Did he take the bike down to CERN? Uh, I have not seen him bike at CERN, but I'm sure he would enjoy the tunnel because you know, in the, tu the tunnel, <laughs> the tunnel, the tunnel is 27 kilometer long, and uh, there are only yeah. eight shafts. Uh, the, 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 I'm talking about the tunnel for the LHC, the largest yeah. uh, mm -hmm. uh, accelerator. So it's 27 kilometers long, and uh, there are only eight shafts to go down. So uh, very often you need to walk quite a long time, and there are bikes that people use actually wow. to go to go um, to places in the tunnel. Yes. Excellent. Yeah, that, that actually takes us to our second speaker. So we had uh, Stephen Goldfab, I think his, his last name is. I, I forget. Who actually worked on the Atlas project? Um, ah, I see. Also, did, uh, yes, did, yes. Uh, I know him. I know him from his music group. I, uh, I yeah, don't know if you jazz, doesn't he? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I've been in uh, performances. Very, very good player. Uh, actually, singer. He's a singer. Yeah, yeah. No, so you you produce a lot of good contents for us as well. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Appreciate it's, it's a great it. place. Great place with lots of interesting people. Uh, that's one of the big things. Uh, I mean, one of the things that I like most about CERN uh, people. What has been the like funniest or craziest or the most uh, the well say the, the craziest experience you've had at at CERN? Uh, I don't know. There's there's a fair number of happy, I mean, the funny moments. Uh, you you have, uh, for example, I remember. A uh, crazy physicist running naked in the CERN relay race. You know, they, there's there's this relay race every year. I mean, not now with COVID, but there used to be this yearly relay race, and there was this guy running naked. Uh, but uh, more closely to our work, I remember with um, the White Rabbit development. White Rabbit is this synchronization network that we designed with Alessandro and many other people. Um, it came, it, the beginning of the uh, design uh, overlapped in time, or uh, as the design was reaching maturity, uh, we had this uh, neutrino time of flight anomaly, which is, I, I don't know if you guys remember, you guys remember from the news, but there was this claim from the Opera collaboration in, in the Grand Sasso National Laboratory that neutrinos seem to be traveling faster than the speed of light in vacuum. Which of course I would do be against, remember. yeah, against it would be against uh, against relativity, and it would be a big thing, of course. So uh, we were asked by the uh, director of physics um, uh, at CERN to to move faster uh, through the completion of the White Rabbit project to 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 try to deploy it in parallel with the other data acquisition systems in Gran Sasso in Italy uh, to see if uh, with that redundancy, we could identify any problem in the in the data acquisition system, okay? So to install this timing system in parallel. And um, and, and one day, uh, he, he wanted us to give a demo to him. And this is some somebody who was very high in management, you know, director of physics is like the second highest person at CERN after the director general. And, um, and but in, in the past, he had designed timing electronics. So um, he was very keen on understanding how our gear um, could 
make sure that two distant locations agreed to within a nanosecond in terms of current time. And, um, and, and so we go and do this demo, and one of my colleagues, Tom, who was the main designer of, of the uh, White Rabbit Switch, uh, starts doing what we call the hot air gun demo, which is, um, you know, you take a roll of fiber and you want to mimic long distance. So you take a roll of fiber, uh, which is five kilometers of fiber in a single roll, and you have it on the top of the table, and you can connect two switches with this roll, and they are as if they were distant with respect to one another for five kilometers. And then what we do is um, we turn on White Rabbit, which is this feedback to evaluate the delay in the fibers. And we see that the two pulse per second outputs align perfectly on the oscilloscope. And then we switch it off and we heat the fiber with a hot air gun. And, uh, and then the, the fiber, uh, so the, the start ex expanding, but also its refractive index starts to change. So the delay changes because of these two reasons. Actually, the refractive index is a bigger effect than the, than the expansion. So you start seeing the drift of the two pulse per second outputs, and then you are supposed to switch white rabbit on again, and they align again because the, the white rabbit mechanism uh, measures in real time this uh, delay and corrects for it, okay? So uh, my colleagues actually explained this. This this is a quite a solemn occasion, you know. This is the director of physics, so everybody is very concentrated, and we want to get things right. And we're looking at the projector uh, at the screen and explaining things to him. And my colleague is kind of very gently moving uh, his arm, trying to not. Uh, focus the heat on the fiber for too long on the same spot. But then at some point he gets carried away with the explanation and he forgets to move it. And then he starts actually to burn the fiber. So you have these people, you know, very concentrated on trying to make sure the director of physics understands all these intricate <laughs> design. But at the same time, the director of physics actually trying to tell us that the whole thing was burning. So <laughs> it was, yeah, kind of a funny moment. Yeah. Hmm. That's when oh. you, you don't ask, have you tried turning it off and on again? You just ask, is, is it definitely not burning? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, I think uh, let's cut this piece, uh, uh, the, the thing I say now. So, uh, But should we close off with, do we have any more questions or do you have anything you want to add, Javier? Uh, let's see. Um, no, I, I, I think I'm, I'm fine. Yes. Cool. So um, we can do this afterward. But the, these founding papers would be great to, to link. Yes, um, there, it's called the me. CERN convention. So if mm -hmm. you Google for CERN convention, you should easily find it. It's, I, I can actually, let's see, I can, in fact, you know, I took these comments uh, from uh, a presentation that our director general gave to in EPFL, which is the uh, university in Lausanne. And I can give you a link to that presentation because she extracted, uh, let's see if there's a chat here, I can use. Uh, let, let me just get an ending while you look for that. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. The, so with those words, okay. I, I think it's. <laughs> so let's start. Three, two. <laughs> so that's a good point to to stop at. So with those words, a big thanks to you, Javier, for joining us. Um, thank you. Thank you. A great pleasure. Uh, and you can always find the pod at fos northse slash pod um, We will put our show notes there with links from what we've talked about and so on. And uh, yeah. See you around.